In this video, we're going to explore the mind map I created for Atomic Habits written by James Clear. And basically, we're going to summarize 48,575 words into one picture. If you're new here, my name is Olivier and I'm a certified math and physics teacher in Ontario who is currently doing a master's in statistics at Carleton University. Okay, so let's go through a few housekeeping items first. This is for Atomic Habits written by James Clear. Excellent book. On the bottom left here, we have the levels of each concept. So for example, a level one concept would be in brown and then a level five concept would be in light blue. On the bottom right is the do the work logo. This is a mind map and there's central nodes sometimes that are called or it's where you start the center uh, often. But in this case, I found in the book that there was really two central nodes. One was that the North Star on the left, as you can see here, is identity change and it's not necessarily behavior change. So that was one central theme of the book. And the other big part of the book was that it's a habit loop. So you have the four steps of the habit loop, cue, craving, response, reward. So let's start with the habit loop. Okay, so the first thing to note with the habit loop, it's that usually it starts at the queue and that's the problem phase. So it's kind of the, the trigger here. So you notice something. So for example, your phone buzzes, this signals a craving, ooh, who could it be? And then it drives a response to check your phone and that leads to a reward. And often the reward is just satisfying the craving and reducing the uncertainty of who it was that texted you. And often a key thing to notice is that the reward and the craving are both a feeling and sensations, which is a key theme in the book. Each of the four steps of the habit loop has a law. So James Clear calls these the laws of behavior change. And the first law is to make it obvious. And that goes with the cue. So you want your trigger to be obvious. Your phone vibrating is obvious if you feel it on you. And it's even better if it's immediately actionable. So for example, if you hear your phone vibrate, but it's across the room and you're in a meeting, that's not immediately actionable. So you're just gonna stop at the craving phase and you might not do the response and the reward. So you might not do the solution phase. Okay, so you want your cue to be obvious. And then there's a few ways to do that. One of them is to design your environment and to, the vision is a huge, uh, it's our dominant sense when it comes to cues. So you want to make it obvious visually, but basically you can make it obvious with different sensations. So for the vibrating example, that's the sense of touch, right? And then eventually sometimes you will have a context that's your cue. So for example, one that I noticed for me is that when I'm uh, on a Friday night and at a specific place, that might be a cue to party or do something social, for example, right? So the cue doesn't need to be something specific. It can become a context after a while. Another way to make it obvious is to have a habit scorecard. So that's in the first, um, the first bit of your building habits is you can track using a habit scorecard. All the links will be in the, uh, the article I wrote and that's gonna be in the description below. And implementation intention is just basically before you start, you just say, when X happens, I will do Y. So for example, let's say you want to start your, to brush your teeth. When I get out of bed, I will brush my teeth. So X would be get out of bed, Y would be brush your teeth. And then you can also do habit stacking, which is just using an old habit to build a new habit. And let's say you're brushing your teeth, that's your old habit, and then you want to start flossing. So after I brush my teeth, I will floss. So you're using implementation intention, but you're stacking previously established habits over uh, to build new ones. And now each law has an inversion. So if you want your triggers to be obvious for you to do something, then the inversion is to make it invisible. So the way you could do that, again, is to design your environment. 
One way I do that personally is junk food. If we do have some in the house, let's say we're gifted junk food, is I put it in the closet or something like that. So just the fact that I don't see it, often I forget that it's there completely. So you want to make your notifications on your phone or whatever it is invisible. So you can just turn off notifications, for example. And that's going to be another central theme of the willpower. If you don't even have the temptations, then it's more easy to have willpower. Okay, so let's move on to the second law, which has to do with craving. You want your craving to, to use the power of the craving. You need to make your habit attractive. So make it attractive. The way you do that is you can use temptation bundling. So for example, if you want to start stretching, you could say, um, when I watch Netflix, I will stretch something like this. The point of doing that is that it makes the habit attractive. It's not as painful, but sometimes you just need to push through it, but it can make things a lot easier, especially if you enjoy watching Netflix and you can combine two things. A lot of people watch TV while they're on the bike or something like that or listen to a podcast when they go for a walk. That's yeah, that's what I do. It's a good way to listen to podcasts, but also take my mind off things and do some light exercise. exercise. Another way to make it attractive is to join a culture. And there's three types of cultures. The close, so that would be your family. The, the many, that's the whole population. And then the powerful would be the people you look up to. So the successful, any, any celebrity or anything like that. So for example, if all the people you follow on social media are uh, health freaks and so on that makes it more attractive to become that because that's the normal behavior and that's what that's what's cool essentially right so if your family you can or your family and friends you can try to get a culture that supports your behavior and that it's the common thing and then that's the desired behavior that's the norm essentially right so and identity is the second uh, central node of the mind map. And really the culture has a shared identity of the thing you're trying to do. Another thing to make it attractive is to make a motivation, uh, motivation ritual. So it could be just a, a song to start or anything like that. Some people, it's when they put their their headphones on, then they, they, they turn it on, they're, they're really focused. And then let's look at the inversion of the second law of behavior change. The inversion of the second law of behavior change is to make it unattractive. So if you want to reduce a habit, reduce a behavior, you need to make it attractive. A good way to do that is to reframe, reframe your mindset. So there's a book that helps people stop smoking. And what they do here is that they basically make smoking really ugly, really unattractive. To do and apparently some people react well to that it's also a, a technique used in cbt cognitive behavioral therapy that they reframe your mindset your way of seeing the world your paradigms all those all those things are a different way to say the same thing okay so now let's move on to this third law of behavior change which has to do with the response and you want the behavior to be easy if you want to increase the likelihood of actually doing that thing you want to make it easy there's a few ways to do that and one of the ways that james clear talks about is to master the decisive moments and that's kind of a meta thing here is that there's moments in your day that has a domino effect on the rest of your day a disproportionate effect so for me it's making my bed if i don't make my bed and take a shower in the morning the rest of my day is kind of out of whack. And uh, he talks about when he gets home from work, if they don't go for a walk or exercise right away, then they just moss at home and eat chips on the couch. <laughs> and then the second way is to prime your environment. So then that would mean to put your yoga mat ready for the next day or uh, put on your gym clothes, clothing before you go to bed, that type of stuff. To make it easy, you can automate. And the whole point of these things is to reduce friction. And it's part of an environmental design. So automate, let's say you're trying to make it easy to save money. You could just automate that completely. Every two weeks, money's coming out of your paycheck automatically. You don't need to think about it. So that makes it extremely easy. It's a one-time decision. 
habit shaping is basically just scaling down habits until they re they meet the two minute rule. A two minute rule just says that you should be able to complete the habit in two minutes. So let's say your goal is to run a marathon, then the two, the if you, you can scale it down to putting on your shoes, that would take two minutes, for example. And then you can build up from there or you can take like a one minute run or something like that. There's many ways to scale it down and to scale it up to eventually running a marathon. Okay, so now let's look at the inversion of the third law and it's to make it difficult. So if you want to reduce a response, a specific behavior, you can make it difficult. You can increase the friction. So there's two ways that they talk about here is the a commitment device. So then this would be a contract. So for example, I have a contract that if I don't do the things I committed to, then I will pay all my friends in the Facebook group a dollar. So that's just a thing to make me accountable. And then there's also one time choices that you can use technology to increase friction. So then that would be something like app timers. And I think there's other software that can like block internet entirely. So then it makes it really difficult to do the things you were want, you wanted to do because it adds so many steps. And fact is we're pretty lazy. So if there's a bunch of steps, we'll do it a lot less often than if it was super easy. Okay, so for the fourth law, it has to do with reward. It's to make it satisfying. So for example, let's say you want to drive behavior, you want your reward to be satisfying. A good way to do that is to use a habit tracker. A habit tracker is simply a thing that you put X's in your cal calendar or in your journal. You just put a check mark every time you did it. And it's just a good way to see and visualize the process. And the process is one of the best ways to motivate yourself. And another thing I've learned that was super useful is that for habits of avoidance, let's say you're trying to um, not be on social media as much, you don't get a reward. It's not satisfying to not do something. So what you can do is to give yourself a reward. So for example, give yourself a dollar or save a dollar in an account every day you don't do something and then at the end use that money to reward yourself with something ideally which has to do with your goal but even if it's something completely different that would be good as well and with habit trackers you're basically trying to don't break the chain so keep the streak going never miss twice so let's say you miss one day it's not the end of the world just it's not all or nothing right you, you can get back on the on the train right away and a reflection practice limits complacency and that's usually a good thing. Okay, so now to the inversion and let's say we want to limit behavior, we want the reward to be unsatisfying. So you can make a, a habit contract again so that ties you to doing the thing. An accountability partner would be to have a gym buddy or someone that you report to, a coach is a good way to do that, a personal trainer. And you can also have negative reinforcement if you're trying to punish yourself essentially, or positive reinforcement if you're trying to build the habit up. Okay, so now let's switch gears a little bit. And if you want to increase your behavior, you can make your reward variable. And research has found that if you have a random reward, it actually increases motivation. And that takes us to the cardinal rule of behavior change, which is what is immediately rewarded is repeated and what is immediately punished is avoided. So that's the classical uh, learning theories from B.F. Skinner and so on. So when you have a variable reward, sometimes when you do something, you don't get a win. And then sometimes you do, so gambling would be a great example. You spin the wheel, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, and that actually increases behavior. So now we're in the second central node, which is the North Star of behavior change of habits is not, is not behavior change, it's identity change. So we actually want to change who we are. That's kind of the, the point of all of this is to become someone. It's not to do something specific. No one cares about taking a cold shower. That's not the thing you want to do. You want to 
become someone who is healthy, who is happy, who is energetic, and so on. So then James talks about an, an onion of change, which is most people focus on outcomes and then they build systems and then they try to build an identity from there. But he suggests that it's probably better to start with who you want to be. And that's a big question. And then go and build systems for that. And then the systems will lead to outcome. So we want to move inside to the outside of the, the, the onion of change. And then each time you have an outcome, it votes for your identity. And your identity needs to be flexible because if it's too rigid, then you can't update your identity. So that's a big thing here. For behavior change, there's basically two steps. You need to ask, what is my di desired identity? So you need to figure out who you are. You can take personality test. And then from there, you need to vote for your desired identity with small wins. So small wins is just the two minute rule and all of that. You scale down your habits to a point where you'll actually do it. So you set the bar as low as possible. And then you have an ag aggregation of marginal gains. So that means that if you get slightly better every day, it leads to a big outcome. So for example, if you get 1% better every day, you'll be about 37 times better off than you started at the start. That's just classical compound interest. And let's say you get 1% worse, then you'd be 3% of where you started from. So let's say you could do 100 push-ups and you got 1% worse every day. At the end of the year, you could only do three push-ups. Whereas here you do, I think it'd be 3,700 push-ups if you got 1% better every day. That's just compound interest. Off of knowing who you are, you can always try to explore yourself, but he argues that you should exploit about 80%. And when you're young, you might want to explore more, but once you know what you're good at, you want you might want to exploit 80% of the time and explore the other 20 or maybe 90, 10. Everyone has different combinations. Let's get into the models of behavior change. In the book, Kurt Lewin had proposed a, a model for behavior change which depended on the person and the environment. So for the person, we're really talking about the genes and inherit traits, and they're roughly like they're roughly fixed. So then that that help you clarify who you are, right? And what you need to be working on. So James argues in the extra bonus chapters that it's important to pick the right game so you don't swim against the current all the time. And one way to pick the right game is to create a unique combination of what you're good at. So for example, for me, it might be that I'm French and that I like math. That's not a lot of people, but I also like health and sports and psychology and all those things. So there's not that many people that can uh, refine th that unique combination. So then it shrinks your competition pool. Okay, so then that was the person. What about the environment? Well, it's to shape the environment. Again, that's environmental design because willpower is limited. It's e ephemeral. That's a big word that says it comes and goes. And motivation is the same thing. It comes and goes. So really, the environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. That's one of the quotes in the book. So the environment and the person is basically what drives behavior. But now I added BJ Fogg's model because I find it a little bit more applicable. You can look up the model. It's just B equals MAT or B M is equal to MAP. Sometimes it's prompt instead of trigger. So M is motivation and ability and T is trigger. So you want your trigger to match where your motivation and ability. So if, for example, if you want to do push-ups, let's say one push-up is super easy to do and you're highly motivated and then you have a trigger when you're highly motivated and the task is easy, you're probably going to do it. So the Goldilocks rule just talks about when motivation and ability are a perfect match and that is the optimal point for behavior. So you want to match those two. So let's say you're only motivated to do five push-ups, then maybe you want to do five and stop there. So that would be your optimal match to actually get stuff done. Okay, so lastly, let's focus on the brain. And there's a good 
analogy proposed by Jonathan Haidt that's not in the book, but I added that, is that there is the elephant and the writer. The elephant is your emotional part of your brain and the writer is the neocortex. It's the clear, um, it's the clear thinking, logical thinking part of your brain. So your writer, you need to set a clear destination and the elephant, you need to motivate it by tapping into emotion. So that would look like rewards and satisfy the craving, but you also need to make it easy for the elephant. So you want to clear its path. Again, there's a good video that I'll link and you might see it appear on the top right. We can't talk about the brain with regards to habits without talking about dopamine because it's the molecule of more. It's the motivation mole molecule. So it spikes before you actually do the thing. So it's, let's say you're craving ice cream, it's the anticipation of ice cream that spikes it. And another thing worth mentioning is that there's things like a super normal stimuli that it's just too powerful for our monkey brains to handle. So for example, social media, it's just engineered to get us to do stuff. So a better way might be to avoid it completely. Some other forms of supernormal stimuli might include engineered foods and gambling, for example, or drugs, like they're designed to hack our biology. So there's no amount of willpower and motivation and setting goals and all New Year's resolution that's gonna help you. You probably better off by just designing them out of your environment because it makes it impossible to delay gratification and just hacks our biology. And another thing with the dopamine cycle and the anticipation of the future is that we don't think of our future self as ourselves. Interestingly enough, we think of our future selves as a stranger. The last thing worth mentioning about the brain is that there's Hebb's law, so neurons that fire together, wire together, and basically says that when we do a thing repetitively, we put in the reps, we form stronger neural pathways. An analogy that I, I like is that, let's say you're walking through snow or walking through the woods, the more times you walk through the path, the more efficient it becomes, the easier it becomes to walk through that path because you kind of like pave the pathway with your footsteps. This leads to automaticity, which eventually you just cross the habit line. So that's the learning curve. It, eventually you, you become so automatic that this becomes a habit. So the question isn't how much time does it take to, be, to get a habit, establish a habit, it's how many reps does it take? How many times through the path does it take until it becomes easy enough that it's automatic? Okay, so that was a complete summary of the Atomic Habits book by James Clear. The whole book fits in one picture and I even added a few of my own elements. Obviously it doesn't include every detail, but the rest is mostly stories. All all of the main concepts are on in this picture. So I hope that you find it helpful. You can download the PDF in the article linked below. If you like this video, you're probably gonna like the other Atomic Habits video I put and other videos that are made exactly for you. The best way to support the channel is to do all the YouTube things. So subscribe to see all the future videos like this video but really it's just to share this video with your friends and anyone who you think that might find it useful thank you for watching and i'll see you next time with do the work